Thank you for joining us for this week's message at Crosswind Church. If you have any questions about this message or about Crosswind Church, please visit us at www.crosswindchurch.net or you can email us at info at crosswindchurch.net. How'd you do? 150 million, is that it, hot dogs? It's not a listen here. Listen, uh, it is Lord of July week. I'm so thankful that you uh, have joined us for worship today. In a couple days from now, I hope that you keep all your fingers and, and enjoy the nice yeah. Fourth of July and experience the freedom that we can celebrate here in our country. I, I, I think for me, having been raised here and growing up in this country, sometimes I take that freedom for granted. I think maybe just some of us all do that at times. I can remember one of the first times that came very clear to me that yeah, something right. had changed in my life, and, uh, and my level of freedom had, had kind of increased. It was when I was 17 years old, I went to college, um, and uh, I, I didn't go near my hometown four hours away to college. Uh, my entire support system, my mom, my dad, my friends, family, and everything was four hours away from me, and all of a sudden I realized that, that it was all on me. Like, I had all kinds of whatever I wanted to do. So if I wanted to stay up late and watch every Star Wars movie back and back and back and back, I could do that. And if I didn't want to go to class the next day, I could literally turn my alarm off and sleep the rest of the day if I wanted to do that. I didn't have to do my laundry if I didn't want to do my laundry. In fact, I figured out pretty early on that if I really wanted to, I could pull a pair of blue jeans out of the clothes and take a dryer sheet and rub it all over my jeans so it wouldn't smell so bad. And we're in the class that no one would ever know, right? That was, I could eat cocoa puffs for breakfast, lunch, and dinner any time that I wanted to when I went to college. It was absolutely amazing to experience that freedom. I had a roommate, though. I didn't know him before I went to college, but uh, I got to know him after we moved in. He, he was in the room right next to us, and our room shared a bathroom. They called those sweet mates, which is just weird to say. Uh, but regardless of that, he was a sweet man of mine. His name was McClain. He was from Georgia. And he had a little bit of difficulty with this freedom uh, and kind of figuring out how to maneuver and navigate that. And so uh, he. Not working. I'm really not working. Can y'all hear me then? All right. This is like a brand new experience. I don't want to do it with my hands. Okay. <laughs> so McClain. Is it just Tom? Okay. <laughs> So talk amongst yourselves. The Holy Roman Empire, neither holy nor ruined nor an empire. Discuss. You met him? Thank you. I could, yeah, thanks. Okay. So, yeah. All right, everybody with me now? That's yes, right. Now, <clears throat> McLean, my sweet mate, he had a little trouble navigating those freedoms that kind of come when you start in college. So he moved to campus and he joined a fraternity and, and, and got involved deeply with that. There's always something for him to be doing. There was a girl. That he was going out with, there was a party that he had to go to, there was like rush initiation things that he had and was always gone. I don't know that I ever remember a complaint like going to class or having a book or, or anything along those lines. At one point in time, <clears throat> he housed a hot belly pig in his dorm room closet, uh, which was kind of against the rules. But regardless of all that, like complaint when it was just he was living life, he was really enjoying his freedom. And the end of the first semester came, and, and grades kind of were passed out, and McLean let us know that his GPA wasn't that great. In fact, his GPA was less than a 1.0. His GPA was somewhere around a 1, somewhere around a 0 0.7, 0 0.8. I don't even know that's possible after just one semester of college, but that's kind of where he was. He had not managed his freedom well, and as a result, his mom and his dad, when he got those grades, they said to McLean, you have to come home. In this little experience that I had. I, I, I learned a lesson. It's a lesson I want us all to kind of learn today. And it's a lesson that's going to kind of govern the rest of our time here together. Here's this lesson. Freedom divorced from responsibility undermines freedom. Let me make sure you understand. Freedom divorced from responsibility undermines freedom. Let me, let me make sure we kind of get what that means. You see, you can have freedom, but if you don't temper that with some sort of responsibility, with some sort of boundary, then, then ultimately what happens is the freedom that you once had, now you won't have. Now we all understand this on some level, because at one point in time, you turned 16 years old, and you got your driver's license, and mom and dad handed you the keys to a car, and you felt freedom until you got a speeding ticket. And then they took the keys back, 
and you lost the freedom. Maybe it was when your parents finally, after you begged and begged and begged, gave you that first cell phone and connected you with the world through the wonderful world of mobile technology, and then they discovered that you had that secret Snapchat account. They took that away from you, right? Or, or maybe it was that time that you were getting a little older and they hit your mom and dad extended your curfew just a little bit just to kind of see how it would go, and you kept missing and kept missing and kept missing until eventually there wasn't any curfew anymore because you weren't going out. See, what we understand is that freedom, when we don't temper that with responsibility, when we divorce it with responsibility, it ultimately will undermine freedom. We can kind of know that to be true. And the thing is, if we were just to pause today and look out on this great nation that we live in, we would come to understand that that's exactly what's going on today. It's exactly what's been going on for the 200 plus years of history of our country. Let me, let me see if I can explain this. One of the questions that was asked was who wrote the Declaration of Independence? In, in two days, we're going to celebrate the ratification of the Declaration of Independence written by Thomas Jefferson. The second sentence in the Declaration of Independence became very famous. You probably have heard it at some point in time, if not had to memorize it. It says, We hold these truths to be self evident that all men are created equal and are endowed by their creators with certain, by the creator with certain unalienable rights, among which are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Right? You may know that. But let me tell you what that sentence tells us. It tells us that you, all of you, you have rights. And those rights, those freedoms that have been given to you that you have, they weren't given to you by government, they weren't given to you by laws, they were given to you by God, by your creator. And the cool thing is, is that because they're given by God and not by government, nothing can take those away from you. And so about a decade later or so, when our founding fathers got together to, to draft the Constitution, to, to, to figure out how our nation was going to be governed, protecting your rights that were given was very important to them. About a year or so after the, the Constitution was ratified, we can find the Bill of Rights, which is the first ten amendments that, that, that follow the Constitution. And what they tell us is that there are certain things that you have a right to do as a U.S. citizen. There are certain things that you have a right to participate in, not to participate in, because you're a U.S. citizen. There's a problem. You see, the Founding Fathers, they assume something. About us. We know they assumed this because we can read their writings back and forth as they were drafting these documents, as they were sitting in meetings trying to figure out just exactly how our nation was going to be run. I, I wrote this down. They actually assumed that your individual expression of rights, your individual expression of rights, would be governed by concern for others. This is what they assumed. They assumed that you have a moral, a, a moral conscience, and that that moral conscience is going to govern how you exercise your rights. They assume that your individual expression of right is going to be governed essentially not by a law, but by your general concern for the general welfare of other people. The problem is that as we get farther and farther away from those documents, what we begin to see is that that assumption is more and more and more untrue. If we separate our responsibility to others, to separate our responsibility from God, from the rights that we've been given, then, then ultimately we, we kind of begin to fall into kind of a, a chaos, kind of a kind of a, an ambiguous kind of, kind of world that, that we find ourselves in. So what happens is that you have rights and you want to exercise your rights, and your neighbor has rights and they want to exercise their rights. At some point in time, your rights are going to bug against the rights of your neighbor, right? Your rights are going to kind of collide at some point. And when that happens, what do we do? What do we do in the The First Amendment to the Constitution, the First Amendment to the Bill of Rights, it says this, it guarantees a lot of rights that we have, but it says you have the right to free speech. That means essentially you can say what you want, what you want, about who you want, where you want. That's, that's kind of what it says, right? And so, and so you have the right to speak out against government, or speak out against church, or speak out against an, an, an organization, or a business, or whatever it is. And, 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 and so you have that right guaranteed you by the First Amendment. It also says that you have the right to freedom of expression of religion. You have the right to peaceably assemble, right? Now, let's say someone were to come into our peaceable assembly today where we're exercising our freedom of religion, walk right into the middle of us and yell, phone, which is protected by the right to free speech, right? And the melee ensues, and we're running over to the children's room to try to get our kids, and Wondering if fire can actually travel through the hangar that is between the two buildings. Like, like as we think through that, maybe somebody gets hurt. 
So he goes, hey, you infringe upon my rights to peaceful assembly, to worship as I, as I so choose. But you have this right to free speech. So, so how do we decide what it is? How do we decide what my rights end and your rights begin? So what we have to do in, in that type of situation is we, we have to sue. <laughs> and then legislators write laws. See, the law ultimately tells you where your rights end and other person begins. The law is what decides those disputes where our rights can butt up against each other. But here's the problem. Stick with me here, because this can get confusing. Here's the problem. See, not an American, but a British citizen from over half a century ago wrote these words. He said, you cannot, by law, make man do it. See, it's this. Now, he's not saying you shouldn't have laws. He's not saying that laws aren't good. What he is saying is that the law is powerless to make you good. This is so important. What he's saying is the law is powerless to inspire greatness. The law is powerless to inspire you to love. The law is powerless to make you a better person. What the law does, watch, what the law does is it defines the lowest common denominator. It defines how bad you can be and still be okay. It, involves, it, it defines how selfish you can be and not go to jail. So what we understand is that as we create more and more law and our society becomes more and more litigious, what we do is we keep defining the lowest possible way that you can go. And as long as we as citizens look to the law to determine how we should live, we'll never, ever, ever, ever be anything other than a selfish nation. Because the law can't inspire you to be good. And so what we've created is a recipe for disaster. When we separate our responsibility to God and our responsibility to others, when we separate that from our freedoms, from our rights, then ultimately we undermine the freedom that we so love in the first place. As law comes in and puts a clamp down on our freedoms. Are you tracking with me? It's, it's, it's a recipe for disaster. And we don't, don't have to look very far to see that playing itself out. But there's hope. Ready? There's hope. And hope is the church. Not, not like a local congregation, although that's a part of it. When I say the church, I mean the capital C church, followers of Jesus Christ. You see, what the law was powerless and is powerless to do, the church can do. Let me, let me explain. You see, you may not know this, especially if you aren't a church person. That's totally okay. But but you understand that, that Scripture addresses our Bible, our Holy Book. It addresses this very issue. Because Christianity came out of a system. It came out of another religion that was based on laws. It came out of Judaism, which was based on laws. The laws that told you these are the things that you have to do in order to be okay with God. And if you make a mistake on one of those things, that's totally okay. You can go and do these other things and you'll be okay with God again. And what happens is a fear-based morality kind of begins to form. I'm not obedient because God loves me. I'm obedient so he'll love me. And, and that's the system out of which springs Christianity. So when Jesus comes on the scene, he says, I'm going to die and forgive your sin. I'm going to die and take away all the repercussions eternally of your sin. Then all of a sudden, the Christians struggle with this law. How, how do I live in that law? Jesus said he didn't come to abolish it. He came to fulfill it. What in the world does that mean? How, so, so now things that once may be unclean, I, I don't have to worry about those things anymore. So I can meet, eat meat sacrificed to idols, drink wine sacrificed to wine idols, because those idols aren't the gods at all. That doesn't make me unclean. Right? And, and, I, and there's places that I used to not be able to go and food that I used to not be able to eat, and now I can. And I used to have to have this operation to be close to God. Now I don't have to have that operation anymore. And as you can imagine, divisions sprang up in the church about what this new freedom looked like and how do you balance your freedoms and your responsibilities. And so not only Paul, who wrote half the New Testament, John, who was a disciple that Jesus loved, one of Jesus' followers, Peter, they all address this topic. A topic that if we're a Christian is something that's planned from God for us to do. But if you're not a believer here today, if you're not a follower of Jesus, the principles that are outlaid in Scripture work in your life as well. So before you just check out and say, I'm not going to listen because you're getting ready to read from the Bible, I'm telling you, if you take that principle and apply it to your life, it has the possibility to change a whole lot about not only you, but our society as a whole. Because what we know, 
But no, is that freedom, divorced from responsibility, it undermines freedom. We were called to be free, both as American citizens and as Christians. So let's take a look at what Paul has to say to us today and see if there's something that we might be able to learn about how we exercise our freedoms, both as Christians and as Americans. Now, we're going to be in a letter that Paul wrote. It's a letter to a church, a lot like this one, a church in Galatia, actually it's a group of churches in Galatia, and they were struggling with a number of issues uh, with regard to this freedom that came from Christ. And we're going to read in Galatians chapter 5, and we're going to begin in verse 13. Okay? Thanks for sticking with me through the history lesson. Chapter 5, beginning in verse 13. If you don't have your Bible with you, it's totally okay. You can follow along on the screen with us. It says, you, my brothers and sisters, were called to be free. Pause. I love this. So he's talking to Christians here. He's talking to Christians here. He says, you have a calling to be free. God does not want you in bondage. He does not want you in chains. He wants you, in fact, to live a free individual. Now, there are certain churches, certain groups of people, and certain Christians who, who want to lean in what, to what we call as legalism. Legalism essentially, as simply as fine as we possibly can, is, is, is a return back to kind of the law. So we want to honor God with our lives, as we should. And so the way that we decide to honor God with our lives is we make up a bunch of rules or we, we read a bunch of rules and we adhere to them so strictly that, that, that we can't ever make any room for error. So you may have heard me say this before. And so we come up with sayings like, I don't drink or cuss or smoke or chew or hang around with girls. I do. Right? That's, that's, that's kind of what, what we mean by that. But, but it goes even farther. Legalism goes even farther. It says that we actually now are going to create rules to keep us from breaking those rules. Right? So I'll give you, give you an example of this. The county that I uh, pastored in before I came here was a dry county. Um, which means that it did not sell uh, alcohol at all in the county. It was dry. But the town that we were in uh, was at the very edge of the county, and, and literally five miles from my church, I could go uh, across the state line in Jefferson County, and, and I could buy whatever I wanted to buy whenever I wanted to buy it. That was kind of, maybe not whenever I wanted to buy it, but I could buy whatever I wanted to buy at some point in time. And there was a pretty famous liquor store just across the, the county line, uh, and, uh, and it was called Wayne's Package Store. Um, Wayne's was pretty famous because for a long time, everything north of that, that exit on I-65 in the north of Alabama was dry. It was dry counties all the way. And so it was like the last stop if you were headed north. It was the last stop you got to Tennessee, right, to buy anything if you wanted to buy it. And so Wayne's became kind of famous, and, and they made a whole lot of money uh, kind of doing that. Now, um, Wayne's was not just a liquor store. It was actually connected to a gas station, and not just any gas station, mind you. It was a gas station that sold Krispy Kreme donuts. Come on. They weren't hot now, but they were better than what was sold down the street. Okay, so regardless, they sold Krispy Kreme donuts. And, and, and it was kind of understood that, that you know, we're not going to go and do and buy and drink and all that kind of stuff. But but I, I remember talking with a guy who didn't even go to my church. It was after church one Sunday. We were standing around. We were talking. And, and, and the subject of this, this liquor store came up. And he said to me, he said, uh, Jeremy, you, I'm just telling you, you probably don't even need to go buy gas there. I said, wow, I don't need to buy gas. Oh, somebody might see you. They might think the wrong thing, right? I'm like, yeah, the, but they sell Krispy Kreme donuts. Like, I don't think you understand like the, the, the severity of this. You see, like, that's, that's what I'm talking about when I say legalism. It's, it's we're not just going to create a rule, but we're going to create rules so we don't possibly even remotely be seen like we're breaking rules. But that, that way we're not guilty by association. You, you track it with me? Now, what, what Paul is saying is that we're called to live a different way. And people in my generation and the next generation under me and so on and so forth, they have, they have pushed back from this in general pretty hard. And, and freedom has become kind of a buzzword. You, you, you may have noticed it in the songs we sing and the things that we say. We talk an awful lot about freedom. And, and so the question kind of comes in, 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 in the younger generations of our church is how do I exercise those freedoms and still honor Christ? How do I, how do I live in such a way that, that I, don't, I don't undermine my freedom by separating it from responsibility? And look what Paul says next, in the very next part of the verse. He says, in fact, I'll read the first part to you. You brothers and sisters are called to be free. But don't use your freedom to indulge in the flesh. Meaning, 
Your freedom is not an excuse to live in licentiousness, to live any way that you want. Your freedom should not be an excuse to cover up what the Bible says is sin. Sin is anything that displeases God. Right? It's anything that separates us or, or, or causes a rift in that relationship that we have between us and God. Let me explain why this is such an important verse. Because people may read this and then they go, well, what Paul wants and what Jesus wants, they just want us to live under more laws. They want us to get rid of those old laws, but they want us to live under these other rules. And we just exchange one law for another law. And that just doesn't seem to make any sense. Let me explain what he's giving you. See, what Jesus wants, what Paul wants, what I want for you is I want you to, to be free. But what you realize, maybe not intuitively, what you, what you realize, especially once you kind of start to explain it, is that living in sin, participating in sin, it doesn't make your life more free. In fact, it often makes your life, almost always makes your life more complicated. Think about this one. Uh, the first time that I ever uh, fished, uh, using a bait caster rod. So you know what that is, some of you know. It's, it's a little bit, it's like an open face kind of real little button on it. Um, and, and it's real hard to use, right? But the fishermen kind of understand. And I, I was on a fishing boat with a man named Martin Nibblett out of Mountain Woods Lake in Alabama. And he said, man, I got a bait caster. They're amazing. I want to show you how to use it. And if you've ever used one, when you cast out, you have to stop the line with your thumb right when the, the, the lure get, like, hits the water. And if you miss and it hits the water, and you don't stop the line on the reel, then you know what happens. The line keeps coming, and it feeds into like a big, gigantic bird's nest there, right there at the reel. And it's this nasty, garbagey, not kind of fishing line kind of thing. It's absolutely terrible, okay? And so then you spend, if you've ever fished with one of these, you've ever done this, you don't have another rod to immediately pick up and start fishing again, you spend the next 30 minutes pulling line. Guys, you know what right? Pull on it. Talking to your buddy, like getting mad, hopefully not losing your religion or cussing too bad or whatever. Like you pull on a line, 30 minutes, you finally get it to where it's going. Now, I can remember the first time I ever bird tested that, that reel, that bait caster. My buddy Mark laughed at me. He thought it was kind of funny. And sure, I, I worked it out and got all out. I reeled all back in, ready to go, ready to cast again. I'm going to catch me a big old bass. And I throw it out there and did it again. Like just the next cast. Just <laughs> All of fishing line, I'm probably tangled up in it, and I'm just as frustrated as I could be. Meanwhile, the bass, I'm imagining, are laughing at me just like my buddy Mark is. Now, now, this is what I want you to understand out of all of that is this. What sin does is it entangles you in a trap. It, it knocks your life up and makes your life so incredibly complicated. And what Jesus did is Jesus comes along and he sets us free from sin and the consequences, eternal consequences of that sin. You with me? So, so what Paul doesn't understand, and what Jesus doesn't understand, and what sometimes even I don't understand is, why, if he set you free from that, would you go back into the circumstances that he's just saved you from? Why would you do it? Because what we know is this. Come on, come on. You don't even have to be a Christian to know this. When you do things that you know this place God, when you do things you know you shouldn't do, when you do what the Bible calls sin, it doesn't make your life more free. It makes your life more complicated. I remember when I was a little boy, the, the Mormons, um, who have really bad theology, but really good commercials. They made really good commercials when I was a little boy. Maybe you remember that. And and, and, and what they, they told one commercial was about lying. And, and there was a little boy who told a lie to his mom. As he walks out of his house, these, these people come up and they start singing very show choir. Like, I remember the song to this day. No one else does. It's okay. I'll sing it for you. He goes, he goes you know, you, you tell one lie, it leads to another. So you tell two lies to cover each other. Then you tell three lies. Oh, brother, you better cover up your ears. So you tell four lies to try to protect you. You tell five lies people will respect you. You tell six lies, and then you'll collect your life of worries and fears. So you lie and lie without even trying. You try to tell. Listen, here's the thing that the great commercial show is showed that when you start a habit of doing things that you know are wrong, it doesn't make your life easier. It makes your life more complicated. We know this when we take sex outside of marriage. Come on. If you've ever engaged in sexual activity outside of your marriage, ask yourself this question. Did that make my life easier or did it make it more complicated? Almost always, every situation I've witnessed and heard, it's made life more complicated. Why then? Why then? Would you use the freedom that God has given you 
to go right back into that kind of lifestyle. It just doesn't make sense. So don't use your freedom for your own selfish gain. Don't use it to, to live a life of sin. Don't, don't use it to, to go back into that lifestyle. Don't use it just for yourself. In fact, look what he says, the very last part of this verse. And then we got to move on. He says this, rather, serve one another humbly in love. That have served one another humbly in love. Now, I have to kind of explain this. Across the church, we define love maybe differently than the world does. Across the we define love as Bible kinds of love is the radical commitment to the advancement and well being of the other. We know what love looks like because Jesus has shown it to us and modeled it for us, right? We then are not to use our freedoms for our own personal gain. We're not to use our freedoms to, to walk back into a lifestyle of sin devoid of morality. We're to use our freedoms to now turn and serve in love of being radically committed to the next and loving another. Let me tell you why this is so incredibly important. Because now what we're learning is that love can do what the law never could. Love can do Biblical love can do what the law never could. The law doesn't can't inspire greatness. The law tells us the, the minimum requirements. The law wants to know what can I get out of it and how far can I push it. Love, on the other hand, says how good can I be? How, how much can I give away? How much can I look out for my fellow brother? How much can I love and serve? My God. Love can do what the law never could do. And in fact, look at what he says next in the very next verse, verse 14. He says, For the entire law is fulfilled in keeping this one command love your neighbor as yourself. What he's saying is that I want you to exchange this law, this lowest common denominator, I want you to exchange it for love. And in loving others and in loving God, you are going to fulfill. The law. You with me? But it's a difference in perspective. No longer are we living to the lowest common denominator. Now we're living to the greatest good. It's this principle that inspired John Adams to write this quote. He said this, John Adams, second president of the United States. This is what he said. Our Constitution was made for a moral and religious people. It is wholly inadequate to a government of any other. This is an important quote from an important man. It's never that some of you are going to push back anytime you hear a founding father talking about morality. You say something like, they owned people. How can they talk to me about morality? But John Adams never owned a slave. He says our Constitution is made for, for responsibility, for responsible people, people that are guided by their morals. People that are guided by religion. Our, our Constitution, it, it, it assumes and requires that you don't divorce your freedoms from your responsibility. If you do that, if you allow your responsibility and your freedoms to go on diverging paths, then our Constitution, he says, is absolutely worthless. It cannot be separated. In fact, he tells us what would happen if they are separated. Look at the last verse. If you bite and devour each other, he says, Watch out, you will be destroyed by one another. This is huge in the church. Isn't it? It's huge in the church. See, in the church, when, when we try to walk that line between grace and truth, we all have different preferences and different ideas. And when, when I want to exert my freedoms and you want to exert your freedoms and butt up against each other in the church, then, then what happens is we form factions, we form groups, we begin to talk about each other and bite each other's backs and, by, by, and talk about each other behind each other's backs. Don't, don't we just naturally kind of do that? In Galatia, they did it. In Galatia, it was about whether or not I had to be obedient to the law completely, as in all of it, as in having operation, and obey certain dietary restrictions, or whether I was free from that. And they, they argued with each other. In Corinth, it was about whether or not you're a follower of Paul, or a disciple of Apollos, or whether you were still trying to obey the legalistic kind of things, or whether you were free from those things, or whether you spoke in tongues or didn't speak in tongues. And today, come on. Today, when we say things like that, oh, man, I, I can't believe that someone would go to church there. That worship is so boring. I fell asleep during the first, second, and last stanza of that hymn. 
or that church maybe has drums. That's the devil's instrument. Right? I can't believe that. And it felt like a rock show. I can't believe that, that, that that's even what they can even call that worship. They don't even go to church on Sunday nights. Well, you know what? Well, they do go to church on Sunday nights. I can't believe that they're still doing that. Or their children's program isn't, or their student ministry is, and I can't believe that they just excuse and they just do and they just, and we fight and we bicker and we fight with each other within the church today. And it's such a big deal. You know why it's a big deal? Because Jesus, one of the last recorded prayers of him, Jesus on this earth, prays to his Heavenly Father. He was prayers to his Heavenly Father. I pray for those who come after me. That's us. That they would be one as you and I are one. Because the world will see that and then know and believe that you sent me. You know what that means? It means that our ability to pull off some semblance of unity is the, is the measuring rod by which the world will judge the gospel. But when we bite and bicker and fight and, and try to use our freedoms to get those things that we want at the, at the exclusion of everyone else, we're not acting in love, we're acting in selfishness, we cause divisions, and you know what the world does? The world looks at that and they go, I don't want to be part of that. They can't even get along with themselves. Why in the world would I be a part of that? Paul says, listen, when we live to the lowest common denominator as Christians, we will fight and devour and ultimately destroy one another. But when we learn to serve and love, love then can do what the law never as Christians, this is a commandment, right? Jesus would say to us this. He would say, a new commandment I give to you. As I have loved you, you love one another. By this will the world know that you are my disciples. By the way that you love one another. As Christians, you don't get it out. But if you're here today and you're not a follower of Jesus, can I just say something? This is, this is something that, that is not a commandment for you. It's just a good idea. Because in our nation, your, your rights are going to bump against one another's rights. And, and, and right now, the solution is to take a selfish route and to look where the law points us to. And let me just tell you something. The law will never inspire greatness. The law will never inspire people to be good. But love can. Freedoms, divorce from responsibility, undermines freedom. But freedom... Governed by my responsibility to love God and love people, that freedom can change the world. Freedom, divorced from my responsibility, that freedom will ultimately undermine freedom. We see it happen all over the world today. But freedom, freedom governed by my responsibility to love God and love people, that freedom, people, not just to change the church, that freedom can change the world. The church has the power to do what the law never could do. So today, you're going to leave here. Hopefully you're not planning a lake trip today because it doesn't sound like it's going to be a good day on the lake, unfortunately. Listen, you're going to go this week and everywhere you go, your rights are going to be pushed in on. As, as you go about today, you, people are going to challenge, and they're going to try to take, and they're going to try to rob, and they're going to try to push, and they're going to try to go to the lowest common denominator. When that happens, here's what I want you to ask. I want you to ask this question. We didn't come up with it. We stole it. Here's the question I want you to ask. What does love require of me? What does love require of me? What does love require of me? Because our church, the Capital C Church, I would argue that it's in a little bit of a crisis. Our nation, I would argue, it's maybe in just a little bit of a crisis. And as long as we keep looking to laws, as long as we keep looking to more government, as long as we keep looking to more rules, we will never inspire the greatness that we dreamed that we would be. Because the law cannot do what love can do. Because freedom, divorce from responsibility, undermines freedom. But freedom governed by my responsibility to love God and love people, that can change the world. Just a minute, that's going to come.
We're going to conclude this service. What I'd like us to do is I'd love us just to celebrate a little bit. We're going to sing a song that's kind of a happy song that, that expresses what we've been talking about. My life is not my own, so I'm going to surrender it to God and I'm going to trust Him with the details. And as we celebrate the song, and celebrate the freedom that God has given us. Let us not use the freedom He's given us to indulge in things of the flesh for selfish reasons. But let us use the freedom that He's given us to turn around and give God all we have and love others with the overflow of that. We pray for God, thank you so much for our time here together today. Thank you for the opportunity we have to come and worship you. Thank you for the freedoms that we experience, not only through Christ as followers of Jesus, but in our great nation that we live in. Thank you for the, the founding fathers, the men and the women that died to, to give us that freedom that we enjoy today. Thank you so much for those that continue to fight for freedom all over the world. Thank you especially, though, for Jesus Christ who gives us freedom from the law and freedom from death and freedom from eternal consequences of our sin. Thank you so much for the freedoms that you have poured out on us. And now, God, that we have that reality of freedom, now that we live in that reality, God, I pray that we would not use that freedom devoid of our responsibility to love you and love people. That instead we would use that moral compass that you put inside of us. That we would use that, 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 that everlasting love that you have poured into us. That we would use that then to pour back onto others. And that ultimately our individual freedoms would be governed by our concern for the greater good. God, help us to realize that freedom governed by my responsibility to love God and love people. God, that can do measurably more than we can ever imagine. So God, we celebrate today. We celebrate freedom. Be honored as we offer to you our praise for the freedom you have given us. We praise you.